whether you are a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, an atheist or a Christian, the general consensus is that you're not happy about what's happening in this country. It doesn't matter what you are, nobody seems to be happy. For example, the right is not happy because they feel that their values and their president are being trashed by the left and their sympathizers in the media and Hollywood and big tech and all that stuff. And then of course the left well, they're angry because they believe the president and those who put him there in the White House are probably racists and haters at heart. No one's cooperating and the divided nation seems to be drifting into ruin, all caused by the other side of the political spectrum. It's never our fault, it's all those guys over there. Christians, of course, feel this divisiveness and long to have a more inclusive, peaceful, and cooperative attitude among all political leaders. It seems, however, that this is a pipe dream when considering the antagonistic nature of our society today. People of faith observe the steep decline in sexual morality, for example, and the the warring nature of the political scene, and we wonder if there's anything to do to turn things around. You get to a point where you're thinking, my, you know, how, how did we get this far down this road? Many times believers feel disappointed and discouraged and dismayed, thinking, well, there's nothing that a believer can do that can make a difference in this cynical and troubled world. These times and these kinds of issues, however, are nothing new. Nothing new. Wars, rumors of wars, societies in decline or ascendance, people's rejection of God, often followed by a period of spiritual revival. These patterns and trends have repeated themselves throughout history and they will continue to do so until Jesus returns. In all of these times, however, followers of Jesus have been taught that their response to whatever the condition of society can be reduced to two simple actions. In other words, when the society that you live in or the family that you belong to or the place where you work or study or serve is spinning out of control, what should you as a Christian do? Two things. Number one, remain faithful. <laughs> remain faithful. Whether the politicians are crazy, corrupt, or dangerous, you remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Whether the society that you live in is in crisis or at war or at peace or in full prosperity, you remain faithful to the Lord. No matter what happens with the climate, with the economy, with your family, your health, your business, your plans, your investments, you remain faithful to the Lord Jesus. The condition of the world, the society that you live in, and the immediate family you belong to, this is only the stage or the backdrop against which the story of your life of faith is being played out. These things are the context that help determine the quality of your faith. Because brothers and sisters, it's always about faith. And for this reason, we should realize that our goal when considering the condition of the world at the time we happen to be living in it, should be to remain faithful in a world at war. To remain faithful in a prosperous and peaceful world. To remain faithful 
in a rapidly changing world, to remain faithful in a politically divided world, to remain faithful in a republican world or a democratically led world, to remain faithful in a communist world or a free world. Whatever the world I find myself in as a Christian, I have to first find a way to remain faithful in that world. It may change but I don't change. I am always faithful. Second thing a Christian does in a world spinning downward into disbelief and the destruction that accompanies aggressive and purposeful sinfulness. Second thing I do, I pass the salt. I pass the salt. Remaining faithful is what I do for myself in response to the condition of the world around me, whatever that might be. Passing the salt is what I do to counter the debilitating effect that disbelief has on the world around me. In Matthew 5 verse 13, Jesus says the following, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. In this short passage, Jesus summarized the effect of the unique Christian character and lifestyle, the effect that this has on the world by comparing them to salt. Salt makes a difference is what he's saying. Whether you use it in cooking or in any one of its industrial uses, Jesus says that in like manner, Christians should make a difference. The Lord emphasizes this point when He says that if salt were to, be, uh, were to lose rather its saltiness, it would then be useless and not good for anything. And in the same way, if Christians do not maintain their standards or their work, they too are not useful to the Lord or to society. Jesus wanted his disciples to flavor the world with the taste and the presence of Christianity. This, he said, could be done by a pure life and good works that the world would see and give God the glory for. And so in this context, Christians today are called upon to be salt and, and make a difference in society. John Alexander, in an article in World Magazine, suggests several ways that passing the salt can effectively be done. For example, we can salt the world through evangelism. The first and most obvious way is to season this world with the name and the message of Jesus Christ. Our first priority as Christians is to live and, and talk in such a way that people are brought face to face with Christ and the gospel. Jesus gave the great commission to the apostles in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Mark 16, 16 to 18. But the work did not end with them. Each generation must find a way to spread the gospel to those who do not know it. We will not be judged by how well the apostles and the first century church did this. We're not going to be judged on how well the church of Christ evangelized in the 50s. The Choctaw Church is responsible for our world, in our lifetime, with our resources and our abilities. Evangelism is not simply the job of missionaries or the minister, it's the responsibility of each individual in the congregation. The only difference is the manner in which we may carry out our efforts to preach to the lost. Jesus commands that we bring the gospel to all creation. He leaves to our various skills and abilities just how we ought to do that. In this congregation, some work at it with the correspondence courses. Others support missions and missionaries. Others preach or write or teach or use the internet. Still others study one-on-one -on -one or invite people to church. Each way to salt the world with the gospel of Christ is a good way. The point to remember is that each person finds a way that suits him or her and begin passing the salt. A second way to do this 
Uh, we can salt through our lifestyle, salting the world through the expression of a Christian life. People may not want to hear you preach Christ to them or accompany you to church, but they can always see Christ in you by the way you act and the way you talk. We can say that we are salt, but people usually reserve judgment about us until they've tasted our saltiness. They may not like salt, they may not use salt, but they sure know what it tastes like. And they sure know that they're tasting salt when they taste it. Christians who have lost their flavor of Christ because they are unfaithful in a variety of ways, unfaithful at church. <laughs> Sometimes you, know, you hear Christians weak Christians talking a pretty good game about Christ and their faith and this and that. And, and, and the, the other individuals say, oh yeah, well, so what church you go to? Well, you know, I, I've kind of been out of duty for a while. You know, I've been really busy. Well, <laughs> that's not very salty tasting when that happens. Or people who claim to know Christ but have no idea what His word says. Or they don't act or speak like like believers, they actually act and speak more like non-believers than believers. All these people end up giving other people a bad taste in their mouth concerning Christianity. People will be drawn to Christ and His gospel because they want the benefits of Christianity that they actually see in somebody else's life. They observe your life and they say to themselves, I want what they have. Benefits like love and joy and peace and patience and self-control, faithfulness, wisdom, kindness, godliness. That's the definition of saltiness. Christians are like those people who offer you know, the free samples at Sam's. We offer a taste of Christ and the quality of the flavor is based on the quality of our lives lived in obedience to Jesus Christ. If people like what they sample from us, they will love what they receive in knowing the one who gives us this flavor. And then of course, we can salt the world through good works. The most dynamic and proactive way to flavor this world with the Spirit of Christ is to do good works directly related to His name. The early church, for example, gained a tremendous reputation in the first century when it began to save and care for babies who had been abandoned. This was the ancient method of family planning as practiced by pagan nations. If the baby was deformed, if the baby was ill, or if the baby was one girl too many in a family, that baby would just be left to die in a field, open to the elements. The early church saw an opportunity to impact its society by taking in these unwanted abandoned babies. This type of charity was unheard of at the time and truly impressed the pagans who noticed Christianity for the first time because of this. The church has a long history of good works and caring for the outcasts, the hopeless causes, the ones who could not pay back, the dirty jobs, the missions in far off beaten, uh, on far off beaten tracks. I personally have always been impressed by and drawn to this type of salting in our society. It impresses me. An example of this in my own life is as a boy growing up in uh, Montreal in Quebec, as you know, I grew up as a Catholic boy, I remember a man who inspired me greatly when I was a, a young boy. As an adult, I don't agree with his theology, but I cannot dispute the dramatic effect of his witness on me when I was a young man growing up. His name was Emile Leger. He was a cardinal of Quebec's Catholic Church. I don't know if you know, but cardinals in the Catholic Church are you know, just under the Pope. That's how high they are in the 
uh, in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And so as a cardinal, Cardinal Leger uh, had charge over six million French Canadian Catholics. He sat on a committee of cardinals from which the Pope was chosen. He lived like a prince. He had a limousine with a driver and he dined with CEOs and powerful politicians. And then one day, I still remember it, one day he announced that he was giving up his duties as a cardinal in order to go to Africa and live among a leper colony in order to minister to them in the name of Christ. And he stayed there for 20 years. He never impressed me very much when he lived in the ivory tower of the Catholic Church's hierarchy. I wasn't much impressed. But when he left that to live in a hut with other lepers, I was very impressed. I was very inspired. Inspired not by his position, but rather by his sacrifice in doing a good work based on his faith. As I say, I don't agree with his theology to this day, but who can argue with his witness? His saltiness was very salty. And then of course, we can also salt through influence. For Christians living in a democracy, there is another way to permeate our society with Christ's presence. We have ballots, we have freedom in elections, which means we can make a difference by influencing government's power. Government has done a mixed job of leading in this country. We have a good system of defense and transportation, many valuable services that the government provides for us. On the other hand, government has also removed the influence of God in school and in law and in government. It has also made it easier to kill unborn children and contribute to the moral decline of our nation. Yes, there's some good and there's, not, there's some not so good things that the government does. The Bible says, however, that we should respect government, Romans 13, 1, and that we should pray for government, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I believe that the church has forgotten the idea that God hears the prayers of the righteous, James chapter 5, verse 16, and they can have a great effect not only for the rich or the sick, but also for those who are uh, under a sick government. You know, we'll pray for somebody who's sick. We also should pray for the government sometimes that are doing things <laughs> that are not uh, healthy. The Bible gives no instructions as far as being involved in politics is concerned, but there are many examples of godly people using their influence for the purpose of good. Esther, who appealed to the king on behalf of her people. Cornelius, the, the centurion who built synagogues for the Jewish people. Crispus, who lent his building for the teaching of the gospel. In a democracy, we have the opportunity to speak out for what we believe is right. And so this gives Christians two opportunities to salt. One, Christian men and women can run for office in order to influence the system from within. And also Christians can affect the system from the outside by supporting candidates who promote Christian principles. No government stands without God's permission but God often uses the influence of many people to lift up or to tear down what pleases or displeases Him, and that includes governments. We can't influence the government, for example, if we don't participate. We can't influence those who are over us if we don't vote. And so we can salt with evangelism, we can salt with lifestyle or good works every single day but the opportunity to salt through influence only comes along every few years. And so I encourage us to make sure that we salt at the ballot box as well. Some people think that the ultimate purpose in life is to taste as many delights that this world has to offer. 
Their eyes are filled with desire. Their God is their appetite and their life is simply a quest for satisfaction. Jesus calls his followers to give the world the delightful taste of Christianity by filling it with the good news of salvation and the good example of holy living and the good works of mercy and the good influence of God's will. If you're not a Christian, then I call on you to give up your self-centered life and become the salt of Christ by repenting of your sins and being baptized today. And if you've lost your saltiness for whatever reason, and you'd like to have your Christian flavor back, then I encourage you today to acknowledge your faults so that God Himself can forgive you and restore you and use you to affect the world once again for Christ. Whatever your need, don't let your fear or your pride, and certainly do not allow Satan to hold you back from coming to the Lord and passing the salt once again. If you need to respond to tonight's invitation, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.